Production of immense possibilities is made possible by the generous support of the Earth and Humanity Foundation. Wendy Selden. Rogue Co-ops, a community-centered collaboration among the Ashland Food Co-op, the Grange Co-op, Rogue Credit Union, and the Medford Food Co-op. Cliff Bar and Company, Elizabeth York, and these additional members of the Immense Possibilities Community Builders Circle. It's right dead smack in the center of what it is to be human, the ability to tell a story. When we share things that are perfect, it's not as memorable, but when we share the messy stuff, it's very liberating for us, and it's memorable for the person who's in the audience. The one piece of advice I always give a, a, a first time or, or beginning storyteller is make sure you have your last line um, memorized. As I drove west um, on my way to Portland, Oregon, where I am now, that thought gave me comfort. And as people tell the truth of what they've lived, we become inspired to act and to live in a different way. Welcome to our weekly visit with people who are creating immense possibilities for healthy communities, solutions to all kinds of challenges. This week we explore a new kind of gathering that's entertaining and connecting people and catching fire all over the Northwest and beyond. Here's how it works. A person will stand on a stage or in front of a room right close to a group of people who've come to listen and then tell a story. We call this exciting innovation storytelling. And more and more people are prying themselves away from electronic screens and wanting to participate. Why? It's, it's, it's right dead smack in the center of what it is to be human, the ability to tell a story. There is an, another theory that, that has it that the narrative art is an evolved adaptation, uh, which we got in the Pleistocene, because those who had it had a much greater edge. They had a much greater survival edge on those who did not have it. If I can tell you that right over there in that river was where the crocodile ate Uncle George, you do not have to test that out in your own life by going over there and getting eaten by the crocodile. Now that's a pretty good reason to appreciate storytelling, whether or not it's on your mind when you go to a live event in your community. And if you're planning to do that, I want to suggest going early, because it's getting hard to find an empty seat at these events. Why is that? We know just who to ask. Mark Iaconelli founded The Hearth in Southern Oregon a few years ago, and Mary Landberg told a story at one of The Hearth events recently. Welcome to you both. Good to see you on Immense Possibilities. Good to be here. Mark, why did you found The Hearth? I wanted to found an organization that could be a space where people could begin to get to know one another again. So the Hearth does that by holding events in which we invite six local people to tell a true story told first person in about 10 minutes in front of a live audience without notes. We have live music in between, we charge five bucks and we give all that money away to a local nonprofit. How do you select your storytellers? Uh, we select it by creating a theme. So we might have a theme like wilderness tales or bully stories or crime and punishment. And then we broadcast it out in different community um, publications and ask for people who have a story around that theme to come in. Sometimes I have to go out and find them. So I go to the uh, hair salon or uh, mm. Louis Bar or I ask people, do you know anybody who's got a good crime and punishment story? And people say, yeah, I know a guy who did some time or I know a retired policeman who's got uh, some stories and I find folks that way. So Mary, you are one of those folks. You recently told a story at the hearth. Why did you choose to do that? Well, I have the fortunate opportunity to spend time in deep, meaningful conversation with the dying almost on a daily basis. And my life is richer because of it. And I have this potential to be able to transform lives with the stories that I hear from the dying. I'm like an adventurer. I go to death's door and I come back with these stories. What was your story about? At the last hearth, I shared a story about a gentleman named Jared who was 51 years old who was dying from AIDS. And his family didn't want to take him in because they were afraid of his disease and afraid of death. But through a series of events, through some really great hospice education, 
I was able to help the family understand what was happening and they all brought him in to their home. And in the process, uh, these people he lived with, these biker people, had these really tough exteriors. And what I noticed was this softening of these hard edges of these people. Well, once death and dying was no longer a scary mystery, they could get to matters of the heart. And to me, that's love and connection. What powers a story like that is vulnerability. So as a person is willing to open up and tell you what their longings are, what they've suffered, uh, what their discoveries were, um, we get to go and experience that with them. So when uh, someone stands up at a hearth and tells you, here's what I've gone through, I'm actually living through that experience with you, which creates an incredible connection. So what Mary is saying when she's talking and she feels like she's reaching right into them, she is in a certain sense. The more vulnerable that sh she is in the telling, the walls come down around the heart, and they come down around the hearts of the audience too. And the story comes alive in the middle. Now I can go home and fire up my computer and find a story that'll more or less be like that, maybe a film, a news story, something. Uh, I can f access literally countless stories uh, with a few keystrokes, more than I'll ever be able to listen to in a lifetime. Why isn't that enough to satisfy what we need? What's different about the hearth is these are your neighbors. And we're sharing the same space together, which is very rare in this culture. We're hardly in the same room together, talking to one another except through or without some kind of media in between. So when a landscaper who I see driving up and down my street stands up in front of us and tells a story of abuse he suffered four years ago as a kid, and then I see him the next day driving the street, that changes how I feel about my town, about him, about my neighborhood, about me. And what happens as people tell these stories is we begin to eradicate shame. We begin to be more honest about what we've lived. We begin to celebrate and discover the victories we've made and in overcoming different sufferings we've, we've dealt with. Uh, we begin to feel a sense of place and a greater sense of community as I share that space. It's all about being in the same space. As long as it's a true story to you, there may be argument, but as long as you believe it's a true story, then whatever it is you've lived, is free to be told up there on the stage. Is that really without restriction? I keep it without restriction. So I get complaints, because sometimes the stories are rated R. Uh, <laughs> as long as it's a true story and it actually fits a story, it's not group therapy, it's not a lecture, it's not teaching, it's not a political statement, it's really a story, yes. And that's been controversial at times. I've had, I've had people upset about that sometimes. I think that um, when we share things that are perfect, it's not as memorable, but when we share the messy stuff, it's very liberating for us, and it's memorable for the person who's in the audience. And the, I mean, I call them, in some ways, I call all these stories coming out stories. They're all about me trying to say, this is who I am, this is what I've really lived. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all, in our culture now, we're all impersonating ourselves. We're, we're showing these images on Facebook, the great vacations, the amazing cappuccino I just had, my son's <laughs> graduation, but it's I don't- It's all perfect. It's all perfect. Yeah. And it's all, in, in that way, it's all isolating and it's disconnecting us. Now, if we're going to take on the problems we have in our communities right now, climate change, the, the, the disparity between uh, the rich and the poor, all these other issues, we have to know each other and trust each other. And that only happens as you tell me the truth about who you are. Now, I've also heard you call it testimony. Is that why? That's what I believe is happening. Testimony is, is me confessing, here's what I've lived. Here's what I really know. Here's where the suffering is, and here's where the hope is, and here's what I've discovered. An ordinary person, they're not a performer, they're not putting on a show, it's a receptionist, it's, it's, a, it's a teacher from a school, it's a laborer, it's a truck driver, it's a baseball coach. These are the kind of people we've had. They're telling you, this is something I've been through. So the most powerful stories are often not from the most polished storytellers. It's the, it's the opposite, it's true. So when, when we ask people to rate, which we've done sometimes, what stories impacted you the most? The professional performers, professional storytellers, are usually at the bottom because there's no vulnerability there. They can even tell you a story that looks vulnerable, but they themselves in that moment are in absolute control versus a person who has never been before a microphone, a massage therapist, I remember, told a story about an abortion she almost had, and then, and then she decided to keep the child. And this was the story of how she became a mom and raised her daughter. And um, that woman, her story, if you did all the ways that you, you, you look at a story arc, she, it wasn't perfect. 
But she was so real and truthful that people came away that night saying that was the moment that made this night. You know, you may be encouraging viewers who are thinking, I can't do that. I don't have experience. I'm not that good a public speaker. That's not what really lands for audiences. No, it's not. So every one of us is a storyteller. Now, are some of us more dynamic, more descriptive, more evocative? Yes. But anybody uh, can tell a story, and everyone has a story to tell that needs to be heard. My, my goal is that eventually everybody in this community gets a chance to tell a story. It's an impossible goal, but that's what I'm after. So can you help me identify the elements to a great story, one or two of them? When stories tug at my heart, that's when I'm impacted. And, and actually, at the last hearth, there was a young girl there telling a story about climate change and you know, land conservation, which is a topic I'm interested in but not passionate about. I'm not a, an activist in, in, in that way. But her passion for what she had to share was so magnificent. This woman who told that story is a climatologist she, and she wanted to get in all the data to convince us about climate uh, change and how we should act. And I told her, if you just tell the story of what ignited you, of how you were touched, of the despair she's gone through, of the hope she found, just give us the story. Don't tell us the facts. You will get more people excited about working towards healing climate change than if you gave us a lecture. Mark, what would you like to do with the hearth over the coming years that you haven't done yet? Well, well the hearth, I see it as a movement. So we've, we've been here in, in the town of Ashland for the last five years. We've just received a grant from the Oregon Community Foundation and support from the Ford Family Foundation to begin to teach other towns how to start their own community storytelling project. So uh, if you go to thehearthcommunity.com, you can find all the information where towns can apply to receive training, uh, subsidized, where they can begin to start their own community storytelling project. Mm. It's growing. It's growing. It's, it's a need. We're, there, loneliness is maybe the greatest affliction we, we uh, suffer under right now. And this is one attempt to try to heal that. In every story, there's an invitation. There's an invitation for some insight, some learning, some action. And as people tell the truth of what they've lived, we become inspired to act and to live in a different way. And so, so my, the possibility is uh, we might become more human, more committed, uh, more alive, and more uh, together. Mark Iaconelli is founder and director of The Hearth. Mary Landberg is a hospice nurse and one of The Hearth's storytellers. Thank you both. This is wonderful work. Thanks for sharing with us here. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you for having us. And I wish we were as attentive as we are to our phones. I wish we were as attentive to wonder, to the 10,000 miracles that we pass each day of our lives. One wildly popular storytelling series has taken root in Portland. And one of its founding producers and storytellers is Arthur Bradford. Arthur, welcome to Immense Possibilities. Uh, thank you very much, I'm glad to be here. You guys must be looking at each other at Back Fence and going, uh, how is it that we're packing people in when there's so much to do in Portland? What is, what is the secret ingredient or is there one? Uh, I think it's that it really is consistently entertaining. There's a there's a feeling in the room. There's always uh, pe people are always paying attention. They're always laughing. Um, there's always a group of storytellers. So if you don't like one story, it's going to be over in uh, about ten minutes. So there'll be another one coming right up. You don't have to suffer through an hour and a half movie if if you're not liking it. Exactly, exactly. It's a, it's a bit of a variety show. Now, the back fence innovated something you call Russian roulette. What is that? Um, so that we have a, a wheel, like the Russian roulette wheel at a casino, and uh, the storytellers, uh, they get selected, and they spin the wheel, and uh, each, each number represents a, a, a hidden theme, um, you know, that it could be a scary story or a, a story about a car, and you ha then have five minutes to come up with a five minute story on that theme. So it, it be, it's very, very quick and, uh, and improvisational. Now, do, do only the experts try that? Is that a like, don't try this at home kind of thing? Yeah, I think, uh, I think you need to have some storytelling experience before you try that. Um, but I think part of the reason why it's fun and why people enjoy it is they know that it's, it's not too rehearsed. So there's that, that kind of tightrope without a net feeling when you're watching it. 
And you've done it. You've done Russian roulette yourself. I have, yeah. There's a, there's a group of people all cheering me on, going, El Diablo, El Diablo. And, and all my friends are watching, and it's this, it's this famous rope swing because you swing out over the river, and if you don't let go at exactly the right time, then you swing back and you smack into the um, muddy <laughs> riverbank, and, it, and it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's not pretty what happens. And so What I love about the storytelling and those Russian roulette uh, nights is is I, I get a chance to learn about what's working and what people are reacting to. So and is the audience more forgiving, knowing that you've had five minutes to prepare instead of days to prepare? Definitely, definitely. They, there's a lot of laughter. Um, you know, if you've ever seen an improv comedy show or something, it's it's always funny when you know that someone's come up with something right on the spot. A good storyteller is always paying attention to the 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 feelings in the audience. So I, I do think there's a real connection, especially when you know that, that the story is very raw and new. If you could name two or three ingredients that make a great story, what would they be? Um, I think the, the first thing is it, it really has to be a story. And by that, I mean, it has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. I think if you really want to take a story up a notch, it has to have a real risk in it. Um, in some way, exposing some sort of vulnerability in the storyteller. Um, and then the last thing, I think you, you, you really need to practice these things and get it down. The, the most common mistake first time storytellers make is they, they go on too long. Well, tell us a story about telling a story. Can you remember a moment on stage that really surprised you, scared you, took you someplace you didn't think you'd go? Yeah, that happens a lot when, when I, I'm telling a story and I'll, I'll think the story that, that is about one thing, but then I'll realize the audience is reacting to something else. And a good storyteller can, can feed off of that. I, um, there, I, I told this story recently about, um, I, I had a, when I was younger, I had a car stolen and then I, I saw that car drive by me on the street and I, 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 uh, chased it down and recovered it. I think when I was telling the story, I thought that I was going to come across as a really sympathetic character because, and then in the end I, I talked to this man and I, and I kind of scold him for stealing my car. But what I realized is people were kind of laughing at me because, um, I, I guess that I, I, what I realized was I wasn't coming across as sympathetic as I thought, and it was actually sort of a funny story. Uh, and the reason was because I hadn't paid for the car. The car was bought for me from my grandmother, and this man who stole it, um, he, he comes across sympathetic. I was very surprised at who the, who the sort of hero of the story ended up being. <laughs> That's good. I almost want to stop the interview and just hear the whole story, but yeah, maybe we'll I, do, I, do that another day. You know, everybody, you always tell stories. I mean, every day you're probably telling some kind of story to somebody. And one thing I've really learned is, is it, it's, it's kind of hard to like a story when someone's just uh, telling something about how great they are. It's always, it's always a little more interesting that self-deprecating humor it goes a long way. Do you ever have occasion to talk to a novice storyteller who's really nervous before going on stage? And what do you say? Yeah, there's I, I, the one piece of advice I always give a, a, a first time or, or beginning storyteller is make sure you have your last line um, memorized. And, and that's the only line I think that should be memorized. I, I think if you get up and you tell a story that's purely off of memorization, it's not going to be very interesting. But that last line, it's like sticking the landing. It's like the gymnast who does a whole bunch of tricks and then lands and, and, and sticks the landing. Just have that last line in, in mind, because if you do, then, then you know where you're going and you, you know when you're ending. I've heard some great stories that just kind of peter out with a person saying it. And so that's what happened. And they and then the, the, it doesn't quite have that note of completion without the, the last line being memorized. Do you think that great storytellers are born that way, or do you think it's a skill that can be really learned to a high level? I think you can definitely learn it. I mean, there, there are things you can learn. Um, there are things that are kind of innate, and, and I think that the, the things that maybe can't be learned so much is, is learning how to read an audience and feeling um, the emotions in the room. And that, that's what separates the really amazing performers from the, the average ones. Look, look out 10 years or so. What role do you think programs like Backfence will have in some of our communities? I am an eager consumer of storytelling shows uh, because of the technology that allows me to listen to it in a car when I'm, when I'm 
taking a walk. So it's that combination now of it, it fits into our technological world, but it also connects us a little more in the in the sort of that that old way that that we all kind of need to of sitting around the campfire and and telling stories. So I think that will continue ten years from now. Um, storytelling, I believe, is really kind of got a moment right now, but I would suspect it'll grow a little more and and be if not more popular, at least as popular as it is now. Arthur Bradford, thanks for telling us the story of Back Fence in Portland. Appreciate what you're doing and that you'd come share it with us. Oh yeah, thank you. As I passed over that, I kind of had this warm, happy feeling where I was like, you know, maybe um, the alternate universe Arthur, like maybe he did okay. Maybe he, his like Burger Shack became a big hit and he found lots of people that were willing to sit with him and watch movies. <laughs> um, and as I drove west um, on my way to Portland, Oregon, where I am now, that thought gave me comfort. Thank you. Our new segment this season is IP Filmworks, video adventures sent to us from communities far and wide. I play synthesizer. I have uh, 14 keyboards. In Russia, I was uh, professional. All day play, all day, uh, not stop. No work, no nothing, just uh, training. I, I never do like that. Work. Yeah, never. I just start here, uh, start in the uh, factory, snowboard, snowboard, make snowboard. And I work uh, two shifts, eight hour work, plus 30 minutes break. And next, eight hour and 30 minutes break, every day, five years, like this. And all money goes <laughs> in the store, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Where blades go dull, uh, I push harder. Uh, machine have three horsepower, motor, very weak. I have five here, five here, horsepower, five here. No, what machine, like a children. No, I don't take break, I give break to machine. I want to make show. That's why I do that. I want to make show, put all of them. And that's it for this edition of Immense Possibilities. You'll find more information and a place to give your suggestions at immensepossibilities.org. 
and we like it when you like and share our Facebook page. I'm Jeff Golden. Thanks for watching tonight. And until next time, please do what you can do. Thanks for watching to learn about tonight's immense possibility. You can watch any of our past programs anytime at immensepossibilities.org.